I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so let me bring up. So this is our introduction, and we're going to just start with the basic foundation. The foundation of programming, of all programming, is three things, input, process, and output. Input is external um, information coming into your script or program. We can think of input as when you're typing into a Microsoft Office document. Input can be from your game console when you're trying to run away from the zombies or whatever games you play. That is all considered external input. What we're going to be doing here is text-based input. All of our input will be text-based input. And I'll show you how to do that in a bit. Process is what we do with that input. It's that simple. That's very esoteric, but we're going to learn what process is because process is dependent on the problem you're trying to solve. There is not one process for everything. It is, what am I trying to do? What problem am I, am I trying to solve? So this is what I have to do with the information I'm given to get the right solution. Output is providing the results of that process, whether it be a calculation or, you know, the, the fact that I, you know, typed in A, B, C, D, E as opposed to a direction in your game. So that's what output is. Output is communicating back to whatever it was that put the input in. So um, I'm trying to think of a good example off the top of my head. I kind of can't right now. But we'll look at what output is as we go through. So, and what I'm starting here is flowcharts, because you're going to have to use flowcharts and you're going to have to use pseudocode in this class. Flowcharts and pseudocode are a way to describe what you're doing in a language agnostic manner, which means I don't care what the language is. I care that this is, these are the logical steps that are going to happen and then I can apply my language to it. Because there are really two parts of programming. There is understanding your toolkit. And in this case, the toolkit we're learning to use is Python. And then there is understanding how to take a problem, break it down into its piece parts, and build it into a logical map of how you're going to solve a problem. That piece can be used with any toolkit. Sometimes the syntax will be different. Sometimes there will be some small things that are different. But that's the universal piece, that you understand how to take this thing, break it down into logical steps, so that you can build those logical steps in your programming language. Okay, the first building block of programming for Python is a variable. A variable is a place to store stuff. And that's why I have a bucket on this screen. Um, and it could be anything, stuff. It could be a number. It could be a sentence. It could be all of the room map for your game, which is what it will be later on. And a variable has, a variable has three kind of identifiers. It has a scope. And we're not really going to start talking a lot about scope until module three, but I like to just introduce the word now. It has a name and it contains a value. So what you will do is you refer to a variable by its name to get to the value. And that's so that you can change the value, but the code doesn't change. Your outcome will change, but the actual Python that you've written doesn't because we're going to use variable names instead of a string or a number. So the variable name, the variable, stores the piece of information you're trying to get at. So variable names have to start with a character, 
and they may not include spaces or special characters. They can include an underscore. So you can have your variable names can be an underscore. They can have numbers in them, but they can't start with a number. So there are some naming, there, there are some rules to naming variables. But pretty much if you stick with numbers and letters and an underscore, you'll be fine. So how do I define a variable? Well, this is how I define a variable. Now, let's talk about what we're seeing here. I have the word amount. It's just a word. I could have said Fred. To the right of the word amount, I have an equal sign, a single equal sign. And I will be saying single equal sign a lot because there's a difference between a single equal sign and a double equal sign. And again, at week three, we're going to look at a double equal sign. So I have the word amount. It is to the left of a single equal sign. And to the right of that single equal sign is the number 10. So the way I read this is I have a variable called amount and its value is 10. You will always know that a word is a variable because it is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. That will always be a variable in Python. So what does this look like for Python? Because um, I haven't, didn't say this earlier. Computers have two resources. They have space and they have speed. And that's it. Everything else is just a subcategory of space and a subcategory of speed. We're not going to deal with speed in this class because we don't develop programs that require speed and us to understand its speed. But we are going to deal with space. And space is storage space. Every variable you create in Python takes up space in the running memory of that program. So you have to think about that. And it's good for me, I know for me when I'm programming, to have a visual of what I'm doing. So I have the word amount. And that word amount is related to the value 10. So when I am saying, when I'm using amount, Python is saying, okay, she means 10. Now, it's very nice because I can also make amount any other number. And when I use it, it will simply get that number. So how do I use a variable? Well, I use a variable by its name. So here's just a small Python script. I have a variable called total coins. I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. By the way, you're going to get sick of hearing me say that this week and next week. I also have a variable called nickel count. I know it's a variable. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Dime count is a variable on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Total coins, variable on the left-hand side of a single equal sign, but I'm reusing the name. So what I am doing is I am assigning a new value to total coins. Now, there's some other stuff in here, and we're going to go through that in a bit. But this is how you use a variable. It is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. It's being given a value. On the right-hand side of a single equal sign, or in a function call, like print, which is at the bottom, it, Python is going to go get that value. So if it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign, Python is going to set the value. If it's not, Python's going to get the value. Um, let's see. So the assignment operator. The assignment operator is a single equal sign. And I say this ad nauseum for the first two weeks because it will become confusing the minute we get double equal signs. So here I have the variable nickel count and I have assigned it from an input statement, which is just somebody typing in. And I'll explain that and show you that in a minute. Um, when it's on the right-hand side of a single equal sign, 
Python's going to go get the value. The same with dime count. Python's going to go get the value. Now what's important is you have to define it before you can use it. So you have to define a variable. The variable has to exist on the left-hand side of a single equal sign before you can use it on the right-hand side. So that's why nickel count and dime count, the variable name, are important because they're what define it. And I'll show you the kind of error you will get if you don't do that. So you have to define it before you can use it. If it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign, you are setting it. If it's, if it's not, or if it's on the right-hand side of a single equal sign, if it's inside of a function call, you're getting it. So I am getting total coins in this print function call, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So there are four types of variables there that Python gives you. And they're determined at storage time. Oh, does anybody ask any questions? Sorry. Uh, no. Okay. They're determined at storage time. So when that value on the right-hand side is assigned to into the variable space, then you have the type of the variable. And Python is, is not a strongly typed language. Languages like C and Java are strongly typed. You have to tell those languages what the type is before you assign it or it's an error because those languages want to know how much space they have to carve out in their running memory. Python's not like that. Python is a weakly typed language, so you can set anything equal to any variable that you want. Um, the four types are string, which is an ordered collection of letters. We're going to do that next week. Integer is simply a whole number. Floating point is a number with a decimal. And Boolean is true or false. And we're going to learn all about Booleans in Module 3 when we start branching. So, a string is, quote, Lisa. And I have a variable called Meister. It's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Its value is Lisa. I have my int, which is 42. My int is a variable, left-hand side of a single equal sign, value is 42. My float is 3.14, same thing. I know my float is a variable, it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. If your eyes have started rolling, it's okay. So, quick foray into functions. The way you get something done in Python, like input or output, is through a function. A function is like a black box that will do something. And it says, if you call me with this input, I promise I'm going to give you this output. This is what's going to happen. And it's just, it's literally you're drawing a black box around some piece of functionality. Now, Python provides a multitude of functionality. Um, all kinds, and we will only start to scratch the surface in this class. Um, and it's all for free. Now, functions have a specific format, so we have to understand how to call a function. In Module 5, we're going to understand how to write a function. But right now, we just have to know how to call them, which means get them to do what you want them to do. So. I have a function name, and then I have an opening and closing parentheses. This is the simplest form of a function. The function name is whatever the function name is. The naming convention for a function is very similar to the naming convention for variables. But you'll see that there's no equal sign, single equal sign in this statement. That's because there doesn't have to be. What I am doing here is say, hey, Python, given this function name, do something. And Python knows it's a function name because of those parentheses that come after it. You have an open parenthesis and a closed parenthesis. Now I'm going to talk throughout this class about balanced 
parentheses and balance brackets. You have to have the same number of opening parentheses and closing parentheses. Right now it's easy because there's one in one, but if you start to call a function within a function within a function, it can get a little much. So some far functions have arguments. So after that first open parenthesis, there'll be stuff in the middle and then there'll be a closed parenthesis, and we're going to see that in just a minute. Okay, converting types using functions. So, so. so. hello, can everybody? Hello, can everybody? Um, hello. There's times hello. when you need to use the function at, because you want to convert one type to another. I can convert a string to an integer, a string to a float, and an int or float to a string. Now, why do I care about this? I care about this because when I bring in data, the way we're going to bring in data in this class, external data into my running function, um, I'm, everything's a string. Everything in Python is a string. If it doesn't know what it is, it's going to be a string. So I need to be able to tell it, hey, this isn't a string, this is an integer, because I want to do math with it because you can't do math with a string. So for string to an integer, I have a function called int, I-N-T, open parentheses, then the string I want to convert to an integer, closing parentheses. And so at that point, I have called the int function, and I have passed it for this example, the number 42, or sorry, the string 42. And what it will give me back is the number 42 into the variable that I have defined called CONV. So C -O convert. CONV equals int, open parentheses, myster, close parentheses. And when I get it back, it's 42, and I can do math. Similar with float. Instead of the word int as the function name, we're going to use the word float as the function name. It takes one argument. That argument, in this case, is my stir. I still have my open and closing parentheses. And what float will always do, if I give it a string with a floating point number in the middle of it, it will give me back a true floating point number so that I can do math with it. Now, I can also change integers and floats to strings. And this is important because Sometimes you're going to have to use it as a string. Well, let's say if you're giving information back to the user, it has to be in a string form. So you're going to have to be able to convert it back to strings. So input and output, and I promise we'll get into a little programming. So input, there's a function called input. Input allows me... As, a, as an external user to send data into the function. It is equivalent to using your game controller, just a lot simpler. Um, and print provides information back to the console. So if you're using a game console and you're doing all those fancy things with it, we have a console as well, but it is a text-based console and we will interact with our programs using text. So I will enter information into the console, or Zybooks will enter it into its virtual console under the hood, and there will be output back to that console. The input that I put into that console will use the input function, and the output will use the print function. Now it's important to understand them because in um, in Zybooks, your what you print, what's inside that print statement, is going to be what's graded. So you need to be very careful because Zybooks is looking for exact stuff, and it can be very frustrating when you've got a new line or a space or a tab in the wrong place because Zybooks isn't going to give you the credit. Now, if you're in my class. I always go one step back and look and see what's going on. If you only have spacing issues, you still get full credit. Um, so let's look at these for a second. The input function 
Oops, didn't finish talking about that one, sorry. The input function takes an argument, or maybe not. Sometimes it's just blank, and a lot of times in Zybooks it will be blank. The output function takes some number of arguments. Usually we're going to give it one. Sometimes we're going to give it two. And what that is going to be is what we want printed out to our console. So let's do a real quick uh, call here, and then I'm going to go to PyCharm and introduce you to that. Okay, so this is just a little script. Here's my input process output, just as a reminder. So I'm going to input something. I'm going to input an integer. And my variable name is num1. I have two function calls here. I have a function call inside of a function call. In the, the innermost is input, which tells Python, hey, wait, I, somebody's going to type something into my console. The outer one is the int function. And the int function is going to automatically take whatever I type in, and it's going to turn it into an integer, because I want to do some math with that. So I have open parentheses, two pairs, and closed parentheses, two pairs. And one of the reasons I'm doing it like this is because this is the way Zybooks does it. It's not going to break these out. You could have two separate function calls. Zybooks isn't going to break it out into two separate function calls. So I want you to understand that you can call a function from within another function, and that's what we're doing here. So Professor Lisa is sitting down there testing her student's code. She's going to put in the number 2, and my input's going to be 2. So now I want to input something else. And that input is going to be, what am I going to input? 4. So I have num1, and it has been assigned the value 2. And I have num2, and it has been assigned the value 4 because I've told Python, hey, expect some input, and then when you get that input, turn it into an integer. So I have two input statements, and now I'm going to do something with it. Well, what am I going to do with it? Well, the problem says read two numbers from user input, then print the sum of those numbers. So I've got to add them together. So I'm going to print num1 plus num2. And that's going to be num1 is 2, num2 is 4. So I am going to print out a 6. My output is going to be 6 to my terminal. OK, so let's take, let's see, does anybody have any questions? Nope. OK. Um, so let's take 4a in to PyCharm. Um, simple input. Whoops, simple input. Do I want to do simple print? We'll start with simple input. So this is just a very simple function, or sorry, a very simple program to introduce you to what we've kind of been talking about. So I have really two lines of code. First of all, this line is a comment. This line is a comment. They start with a pound sign, their comment. This line is a comment. I effectively have two lines of code. I have line four, which is setting some input to my variable, and line seven, which is going to print it out. So my favorite thing that you will learn about PyCharm is the debugger. And that's because I can actually walk through each line of code and watch what it's doing at the time that it's doing it. And for me, that helps. I do it actually in my day job. I use the debugger all the time, especially when I'm dealing with very complex code because I really want to see what's happening on the inside. When you've got a very complex algorithm, it can be very helpful. So I'm going to start by hitting this little button here. This little button here is the debugger button. And well, we're going to do this. Here we'll just do similar to lab 1.1. 1 
um, because that's what was in. So here, so let me, let me go back. Here's the debugger button. Here is the run button. Run will just simply run it. Debugger will allow you to stop in the code and examine what's going on. So how do I get it to stop? Well, these little red dots are what are called breakpoints. So and all I have to do to set or unset a breakpoint is to click right next to the number. So I have just set a breakpoint, which means PyCharm is going to stop there. It's going to stop where this blue line, well, it's going to stop where the red dot is before it executes that line. So this line hasn't been executed. I partly know that because when I go over here to console, this is where I'm going to put information in and get information back. So this is called a text-based interface. And that's what we're going to be using in this class. Currently, there's nothing here. Now, if I look at my code, sorry, let me make that bigger. Oh, I apologize for yawning. I've been working too much. Come on. I know I can make this bigger. No, that's not what I wanted to do. There we go. So, um, I am currently stopped on line 13. How do I know where I'm stopped at? I am stop I know where what line of code that I haven't run yet or what line of code I'm about to run by this blue line. That blue line says haven't done this yet, but if you hit continue or you hit step over, I'm going to do that. So, here is the step over button. And what the step over button does is it takes you to the next line of code. And if you have to wait for something like user input, it's going to wait. And I use that all the time. So I'm going to step over line 13. So the blue line went away, but we now have this red line here. That red line is basically telling us Python is waiting for input from us. So it's enter a number. I'm going to enter the number 42. Now, what, what Python is waiting for is me to enter a number and then hit the enter key. So I have to hit the enter key. Now my blue line came back. My blue line came back, and it's waiting to execute this line of code. But what Python is doing also, it's telling me what just happened in Python's memory. If I look to the very far right of line 13, I see user underscore input, which is the name of my variable. You know it's a variable. It's on the left-hand side of single equal line. It has assigned the value 42 to that variable because that's what I told it to do. And the other way you can look at this is there are something called frames and variables. It's a little tab. If I select that tab and select the variables tab underneath it, I can see all the variables I've defined and what their values are. Now, this will become very, very handy when we start getting more complex variables like lists. But even now, it's very useful. So I'm going to step over, and what it's going to happen is it's going to print the user input. Print means output, and it's going to output the value of user input. So if I go back to the console and I watch watch under the enter 42 and I step over, I get just what I told it to do, the number 42. So I'm now going to step over and it says print. This was the user input and I'm going to do a format user print. So, And that's just a particular way of doing the format. So I'm now going to print out this was the user input. Now I'm asking for it to enter a float. I haven't actually asked anybody yet because the blue line is on 18. So what am I doing here? I have the input function call. Inside the input function call, I have the words enter a float colon. And surrounding that function call, I have a call to the function float, which is assuming that this is going to be a float and it's going to convert it to something I can do math with. 
So I'm going to step over line 18, and line 18 is waiting. So I am going to do 3.14. I'm going to hit the enter key, and now I'm on line 20. We just have to follow the blue line. Now I'm going to output it. Now this has a special format modifier with it that we're going to uh, you're going to need. And I'm going to print out my float with only two decimal places. So if I had entered it with 100 decimal places, it would only print it out with two. And then it's just going to say this is a string and format the user output. So that's a lot. That was a lot that we just did. But there's a pattern here. And the pattern is you're going to input something, and then you're going to do something with it, and you're going to output. Now, in this case, we input something, and we turned it to an integer. We did something with it. In this case, we turned it to a float. And in this case, we just, and then we printed it out here, and we printed it out here. Input, process, output. So, no questions yet? Okay. So, let us go back to the keynote. So, let's talk a little bit more about the print function. There are, you can call the print function in a couple different ways. You can call it with a single argument, or you can call it with multiple arguments. And an argument is simply what is inside the parentheses of a function call. That's all it is. It can be a variable. It can be a string. It could be an integer. It could be a float. It could be pretty much anything. Um, so I have the function name of print. And print, you can assume, means output for what we are doing in this class. I have the argument. In this case, it's a string that says 3, 2, 1, go. Before that argument, I have an open parenthesis, and after that argument, I have a closed parenthesis. So, when I say print 321go, it's going to put 321go to the screen. That's what it's going to do. Now, I can print a function call with two arguments. This is important because you're going to have to do this in a lab this week. So, I have two calls to print. The first one says line one, and I have this comma and this end after it. So the first one is I'm going to print the string line one. The comma separates two arguments. So I have two arguments here. I have argument one, which is the string, and argument two, which is this end. And what end does is it tells you what to do after you've printed whatever it is that's to the left of that comma. The normal end for Python is a new line. So it'll just go to the next line and wait for something to happen. But sometimes we don't always want it to do a new line. We just want it to put a space or a comma or any kind of other thing than a new line. So this second argument is about um, adding, it's about controlling what the end of the line looks like or sorry, whether or not it's an end of a line or just a space. And then I have the word continued after it. So what this will look like is line one, a space, and my bad, that's in the wrong place, continued. So instead of it being a new line, it is the same line. And again, you're going to need to do this for one of your labs. Okay, for every parenthesis, every open parenthesis, there has to be a closed parenthesis. Print ends in a new line until you tell it not to, and arguments are separated by a comma. All arguments are always separated by a comma in everything you do in Python. The end equal two quotes, quote space quote, tells it to not print a new line but instead use a space. Okay, so the secret life of a Python script. The following program calculates yearly and monthly salary given an hourly wage. The program assumes a work hours per week of 40 hours per week and a work year of 50 weeks. So we're going to have start. We're going to input stuff. We're going to input an hourly wage of 20. 
That's our input. We are going to process that. Well, what, how are we going to process that? Well, what do we want to do first? We want to calculate the yearly salary and the monthly salary. So the first thing I need to do is get my wage. And then I need to know how many weeks out of every year, how many hours a week I'm working. And then I need to know how many weeks out of the year that I'm working. Well, the problem tells us that 40 is the number of weeks. and Sorry, 40 is the hours per week and 50 is the number of weeks per year. So I can calculate the yearly as hourly times 40 times 50. So it would be 20 times 40 times 50, which is 40,000. And then I can do the monthly, which is 20 times 40 times 4. So that's 3,200. And then it's going to want me to output that information by saying annual salary is. And then it's going to print the yearly. And then monthly salary is. And then it's going to print the monthly. And you're going to have a lab similar to this. And by the way, at the end, if anybody doesn't hasn't seen it yet or their teacher didn't tell them about it, all of this goes up on my YouTube channel. And all of the challenges go up on the YouTube channel. Um, and any additional things we might have done in the class will go up into the description. And um, the other thing I wanted to tell you that I forgot to tell you at the beginning was Challenges are not required for your grade. I suggest that you do the challenges. I think they are very helpful in, in guiding you through how to build a bigger and bigger program in the Zybook modules, but they are not part of your grade. So you do not have to do the challenges to make your grades in Zybooks. Um, okay, and then the program ends. Statements and expressions. So, this is a statement. A statement has an equal sign in it. A statement has an equal sign. An expression generally is part of what your process is. So, an expression does something with the data. So, even though this one has an equal sign in it, a single equal sign, it is processing the data. So it's more of an expression. And then a statement is a function call. Now, this is not something you really need to spend a lot of time doing or thinking about, but Zybooks mentioned it, so I wanted to mention it. Cases and spaces matter. Python is a case-sensitive, space-delimited language. What does that mean? That means lowercase x is not the same as big case x. And I see this happen with students, especially in the beginning of class. They become, um, they, they, they get frustrated because they don't know why they're trying to use a variable in a print statement and it's not, and, and it's spelled the same, but the letter cases are different and they don't understand what's going on. What's going on is that the, the variable names and function names are all case sensitive. So if the variable name is a lowercase x or a lowercase Fred, when you use it, it has to be identical or you're going to get some error messages. Space delimited. Space delimited is that it has to line up. It has to be left justified. Um, and this won't become much of an issue until week three when we start getting into local scope where it's going to become an issue um, because you have to manage where your code is in terms of indentation. So space delimited means that um, when you hit that, that what separates a line of code from another line of code is an enter statement, sometimes a colon. So you have to make sure that you each line of code you type and hit the enter key. This is one of my least favorite things about Python. I like to have a character delimit 
the limiter. I didn't do it probably because a lot of people hate having to put a semicolon at the end of their expression or their statement. I like it. Um, But with Python, you don't have to put something like a semicolon. What you have to do is hit the enter key. And then you have to make sure the next line is, in fact, lined up to the left exactly the same way as the line before it was. So not all characters are visible. Every character has a numeric representation. And this is why cases and spaces matter. Because under the hood... Uh, all computers look at the value associated with that table. Um, There's something called the ASCII table that is a very old thing. There's also UTF-8. But every character, an A, an X, a capital X, all translate into a number. And, um, and this includes non-visible characters. This includes spaces. This includes tabs. This includes new lines. There's a, a numerical representation for the meaning of a bell on the computer. Um, and so we have to remember that. It becomes important, especially next week in strings, but um, they allow these numerical representations allow the computer to handle special characters, like a space. So we don't see a space, but the computer says, this is a space, so the numerical representation is 32. This is a tab. We wouldn't see a tab. We would just hit the tab key. But under, under the hood, Python is going to key is going to say, okay, that's really an 09. That's how it knows. Okay. Handling special characters, because you have to do a little bit of it this week. Um, there is an escape sequence. A backslash in parentheses has a special meaning. And if you want to show the backslash in parentheses, you have to use two. Um, a single quote can be, your quotes for strings have to be balanced. And they have to be the same kind. So if you open with a single quote, you have to close with a single quote. If you open with a double quote, you have to close with a double quote. But if you, let's say you opened with two double quotes, a two single, you open and close with single quotes, but you also want a single quote in someone's name, like O'Donnell. The way you do that is you do a backslash and then the single quote, because what that tells Python is this really isn't an ending quote. This is a character that I want you to represent. Um, Same with double quotes. New lines is a slash N, backslash N, sorry. And tab is a backslash T, and you're going to need these in one of your labs. Okay. Arithmetic operators. So, a lot like math. Plus, minus, the star or shift A is multiplication. Division is a slash, exponentiation is a star star, and we're going to learn about a couple of other operators as we go along in the class. Um, So we're going to go over some of the labs now, and then we can go back and look at some code if you want. But we've got 10 minutes left. So... And I don't like to keep students longer. Some some students are like me on the East Coast, and it's 10 o'clock. Some people are on the left co- the West Coast, and it's 7 o'clock, but I don't like to, to run it really long. So lab 1.9 is complete the program to read four values in from input, um, store those lines in four variable names. Now, it gives you the variable names, so it's first name, generic location, whole number, and plural noun. And then it's going to use those inputs to output a short story, and they're going to give you what they want for the short story. So when I go over the labs in week one and week two, because we haven't really started to get into pseudocode yet, we don't do that till week three, I'm going to use flowcharts. 
starting week three, I'll probably, I will stop using the flow charts and start using pseudocode. But in this case, what we're seeing is we have start, we're going to input first name, we're going to input generic location, we're going to input whole number, and we're going to input plural noun. And then I'm going to output the sentence. Now the sentence is that they want you to output is actually already in the Zybooks lab. So the real trick here is getting your input statements correct and using the variable names they're telling you to use. If they tell you to use the variable name of first underscore name, then your variable is going to be first underscore name. It's going to be on the left hand side of a single equal sign. On the right hand side is going to be the input function with whatever Zybooks has told you to put in there in the same way they've told you to put it in there. All right, lab 1.12. So um, we have a variable like user num that can store a value like an integer. Expand the given program as indicated. So PyTerm has given you a program. We're going to output the user's input. We're going to output the input squared and cubed. Um, and then we're going to get a second user input into user underscore num2, and we're going to output the sum in the product. So here, if we look at the number of inputs, we have two inputs. So we're going to have one user input for user underscore num. We're going to have a second one for user underscore num2. And then we're going to do something with it. We're going to process it by squaring and cubing it and then doing a sum in a product. So I'm going to start my, my program. I'm going to input user num. And then I've got to make sure I convert it to an integer. Now, I can do that on two separate lines, or I can do it like we've done in our, our examples here on a single line. I'm going to square, which is the number times the number. And then I'm going to output the squared number. And then... I'm going to cube the number. I'm going to output the number cubed. I'm going to get my second input. I'm going to convert it to an integer. Got to remember to make, make sure you convert it. I'm going to sum user num and user num2. And then I'm going to output that. And then I'm going to multiply user num by user num2. I'm going to output that. And I'm done. So we have two inputs, couple calculations, and two outputs, I'm sorry, and one, two, three, four outputs. 1.23, so you're going to have program using integers, user num and x as input, and output the user num divided by x three times. Now, um, so, output is using the print function. Input, they're saying using integers user num. So, what they didn't say is you have to input it, but that's what that implies. Okay, and we're going to be converting it to an int. We're also going to have an input for x. We're going to convert it to an int. So, I'm going to start my program. I'm going to input user num. I'm going to input x. Then I'm going to say convert user num to an integer, convert x to an integer, divide user num by x. And now here's something important. I have a variable called div on the left-hand side of that division. And that's because I'm going to then divide div by x again. That's how you get the right output. It's not user num divided by x three times. It's user num divided by x. I'm going to assign that value to a variable. In this case, the variable's name is div. I'm going to output that. And then I'm going to set a variable named dev2 equal to div divided by x. I'm going to output that. Then I'm going to assign a variable called div3 equal to div2 divided by x. I'm going to output that. And then I'm done. So 
some people get this wrong because they're just doing they're doing user num divided by x, user num divided by x, user num divided by x. That's not what this lab calls for. Okay, so this is a little bit longer, but it it's more of the same. Okay, you're going to input some variables. You're going to input age, weight, heart rate, time. All of those have to be input. And then you're going to output the average calories burned for a person. And each floating point value with two digits after the decimal point, which can be achieved by following. So what you want to do is you want to define a variable called calories. Okay? Uh, sorry, in this case I'm going to input age, weight, heart rate, and time. Now the variable names are important here because they give you the calculation with the variable names already in them. So I'm going to convert age to an integer, weight to an integer, heart rate to an integer, and time to an integer. Then I need to calculate the calories. Calories is also provided in the script. And then I'm going to output that. Now the trick here is to make sure that your calculation is in is calories. Sorry, the variable name for the calculation is calories, because then you can just use this the way it is, and it has the format specifier. That squiggly brace colon dot two f squiggly brace is what's called a format specifier. We will get to some of those a little later. And it will tell Python how to output a float in the way you want it. And then I end the script. And we have one more lab. So we're going to, the user is going to enter an integer between 32 and 126, a float, a character, and a string, and store them into separate variables. Then it's going to output those four variables on a single line separated by a space. And it's going to output them in the reverse. And then it's going to convert the integer to a character using the chr function. Just like a stir or an int function, we have a chr function. So I'm going to start. I'm going to input user. Sorry, I'm going to input user int. I'm going to input user float. I'm going to input user care. And I'm going to input a string. After I do that, I'm going to output everything. I'm going to output everything in the reverse order. I'm going to convert user int to a character using the char function. I'm going to output that character, and then I'm done. And by the way, down here is a resource for the char, and it will show you examples of how to use it on that link. So. Yes. You mentioned your previous that you can't input something directly as X, Y, Z. Every integer string binary is automatically a string until converted. That's right. Is there a way to avoid the conversion syntax to save keystrokes, or is it just it's a limitation of Python? The the Tim the Python assumes a string. That's its base data type. Um. So you can't get around it if you're using the input function. It's that simple. If you're writing some other kind of code, you might be able to. But, um, uh, okay, I was referring my quote directly to my SQL. Well, if, for Python, it's a limitation. You can't get around it. So, are there any other questions? No problem. And by the way, you can open the mics now. If people want to uh, ask any questions, they can. Um, while I'm thinking about it, what will be up on the YouTube channel? And I'll put my um, URL in the chat. All of this code will be up there on the YouTube channel. So all of the challenges and some other stuff that I have written, like variable.py, 
which just tells you how to use a variable. And any of the challenges that you're going through, they're all up there as well. So let me go out and do that while I'm thinking about it. And go to me, go to my channel. So this is where I keep all of the stuff that I do for this class. And there are previous, there are, there are um, previous term lectures and they're all on playlists. So let me put this here. This is the link to the YouTube channel for anybody who's in my class. It is um, in an announcement. Um, and you can see the playlist. You can go out and look at the playlist for Module 1. I keep about three years worth of lectures here. They're all similar. Sometimes we have different discussions. So, um, and the videos are usually up by Friday evening. So, does anybody else have any questions? Going once, going twice. If you're in my class and you're here, please feel free to reach out to me and um, ask me any questions you need. I hope everyone enjoyed the class, and I will uh, maybe see some of you next week. Have a great 4th of July. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.